Good morning, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Open up with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, please. We have uh, a consideration before us today of the life, the ministry of the man of God, the pastor, and especially in in, uh, Timothy's context, the young pastor. Uh, Before we get into the Word of God, I want to announce or at least update you on something exciting. We have cracked over the $20,000 mark in our um, uh, pastor's new shirt fund. No, in the the building fund, we've got 20,700 something. Praise the Lord. I was talking, I was doing some maths, some projections and visions with my wife yesterday and we figured out that being about 50%, uh, sorry, 5%, lose a zero, about 5% of what we need for the deposit if we were to build, a, I mean, build or buy a building, etc. cetera, that if, on the current projections that would get us buying a building in about three years, which is great. By that time, the dollar may be worth less and we'll have to start again or we may be so big we got to resize the building scale we don't know so if you have this, the gift of generosity this god just told me this is your church and uh, um if you are not a christian but you are very rich um let's just chat uh right <laughs> <laughs> so, you're in First Timothy chapter 4 right now, and that's where we will be uh, learning from the Lord God. Uh, war, let me, let me start with this uh, sort of analogy, this mindset thinking. Uh, war is, if you've served in the army, if you've been deployed, you know this. Uh, war is so easy, there's no suffering, no difficulty at all. It is so simple. Point, pull trigger, people die. The bad guys die. That's, that's, that's all it is. Um, now, the one complication of that is that they also have guns, army tanks, and helicopters with, you know, boom things. Oh, that one complication makes everything different. Another analogy, rugby is so easy. It is easy. It's so simple. Anyone could do it. A frail old grandma could likely do it. Uh, all you have to do is pick up a very light ball. It's full of air. Eh, not bad. And then you just go and put it down on one side of white chalk. It is so simple. Except for the fact that there's 120 kilogram white guys or 180 kilogram Islander guys sprinting at you with intent to flatten you. That changes the game a lot, doesn't it? Um, If you don't like violent analogies and you're a nerd, Frodo had a very simple, simple task. It was simply to throw a small golden ring into a fiery pit. Not hard at all, a very light thing to throw, not a big projectile. What made it difficult was the ring rays and the dragon things and a very old angry wizard and 10,000 Urukai. Um, so, so, so there's some things that on paper seem really simple, but on the ground in real life are extremely complicated. And today what we see in verse 11 is Paul tell Timothy, here's ministry, all right? Command and teach these things. What's these things? The stuff I'm writing. All right, find what the apostle wrote down in our Bibles, command them, explain them, explain them, then command them. Ministry is so easy. Do you know what makes ministry really, really hard? You. All right, it's simple. If all I've got to do is explain it, I'd do a bit of reading, explain what it means, and say, go and do likewise. Here's what Richard, uh, I think it was actually Thomas Watson, maybe one of the Puritans said this. Other jobs, like a carpenter or maybe a knitter or you're a painter, you stop your work, you go home, you go back to your work, and it's as you left it. As a minister, you preach and you exhort and you remind and you teach. You go home and you sleep and you wake up and you come back to work, and it's gone. It's been unraveled. It's been deconstructed. People have forgotten. The enemy has come in. There is a tear sowed along the wheat. And, and so like, everything is always undoing the work of the ministry because the work of the ministry is people. Is people. And, and we are the glory of God, made in His image, sanctified by His blood, filled with His Spirit. But this side of the resurrection, we are still afflicted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So Paul says... Very simple. Command and teach these things. And it's as, if, it's as if as he's writing this, then Timothy, who he's talking to, comes to his mind. He thinks, Timothy. Command and teach things, things Timothy. Now, that's a hard job for Timothy. Because while it seems simple on the front, Timothy's huge front rower running at him as he's trying to put the ball down. Timothy's Russian fighter jet flying over uh, ahead. Timothy's complication that makes the otherwise simple job very difficult is that he is a young man in an established mega church in a culturally uh, a, a rich city 
that in a, and the church has started to fossilize and become self-righteous. And as a young man in their culture, he does not automatically demand respect. And he's standing in the most respecting, respectable, most important authoritative job that there is in the universe, which is a heralder of God's word and a pastor of a church. So Paul says in today's passage, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. He has to then immediately pick up on this difficulty and the rest of the passage is really answering the question, how can a young pastor maintain order in God's household in such a hostile environment? How can a young man who is a pastor maintain order in God's household for fruitful labour, for great commission advancement? How can he do that? when he's despised, when it's a hostile environment. And there's going to be two answers given to us. Look at verse 12. I'll sort of structure for you our sermon today, and then we'll go through it. Verse 12 is like a summary subheading. And then verse 13 and 14 are the first half of the application. And verse 15 and 16 are the last half, uh, uh, the second lot of application. In other words, he says these two things. How can a young man maintain order despite the hostility? First of all, let no one despise you for your youth. Don't let him despise you. Secondly, here's the second thing he can do. Set the believers an example. Verse 13 and 14 apply to how to not let people despise your youth. Verse 15 and 16 apply to how to set them an example. And so we really have a neat little uh, uh, study here today. And then he concludes in the last sentence of verse 16. So our understanding, how can a young pastor maintain order in God's household in such a hostile environment? Let us read the word of God together. Paul says, command and teach these things. Let no one, no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct in Love and faith and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to the exhortation and to the teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the doctrine. Persist in this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. May God bless his own word in our midst this morning. You will see from this command of Paul, let no one despise you for your youth, that the problem in Timothy's life is not that he's young. That's not the problem. The problem in Timothy's ministry is that the people he's preaching to care that he's young and despise him for his youth. Actually, that's not true. It's not a problem that people despise you. Jesus would have something to say about living a whole life and preaching the word of God to a people that despise you. Doesn't excuse you. The problem was not that they thought he was young. The problem was that Timothy allowed them to think that it's okay to despise him for his youth. He allowed them to intimidate him, make him draw back and change the tenor and tenacity and vitality of his preaching ministry. So it all comes back to the man of God. He must bear ultimate responsibility. Paul's saying, it's up to you, Timothy. They can think whatever they want about you. Don't let that affect your ministry. Don't let them despise you for your youth. Part two, set them an example. So let us understand this first part. Let let no one despise you for your youth, which we see expounded and explained in verse 13 and 14. Paul is writing to Timothy. Now, he's calling him a youth. You may think, how old is this guy? Is he 16, 17, beardless, uh, uh, jobless, still wears thongs and drives a very old, you know, Corolla uh, that squeaks a little bit and is foot pedaled? Like, uh, how, how old is this guy? Is he as young as Charles Spurgeon, you might think? Is he, is he Charles Spurgeon's age when Charles Spurgeon was first called in the 1800s uh, to Water Beach Church to be a pastor at the ripe old age of 17? That happened to Spurgeon. Is that how young Timothy is? No, Timothy is so young that he is in his mid-30s. Hallelujah, if you're mid-30s and feel like you're getting old, young, biblically at least, 
biblically very young, okay? Um, in their culture and in their day, you were a youth not worthy and not demanding of respect until you were at least about 40. It's when your, your hair starts going gray, maybe falling out. You've got some scars to your name. You've developed a business, a, a, a reputation. At 40 or so, you automatically get respect. You're a, an aged man, a real man, an old man. You are old. They would call you really old, you know, north of like 55 or so. So you've got about a decade in there to be a real man. In Timothy's day, like, so, so think of Timothy's timeline. When Paul went on his first missionary journey and he visited Galatia and went to Lystra, Timothy was there. And he was probably mid-late teenage years. When Paul went back home and then wrote his scathing letter of Galatians, Timothy was sitting in church hearing that preached. He was about 19 or 20. When Paul came back through on his second missionary journey and the elders at Timothy's church said, Timothy loves the word of God. He has fruit in his life. We think you should take him on the missionary journey. At that point, when Paul and the elders laid their hands upon him, prayed over him, received a prophecy about his gifting, and imparted to him a spiritual gifting for the ministry. When that happened, Timothy was probably 21. He labored and worked with Paul all around the Mediterranean in his Great Commission endeavors. And then when he is sent to Ephesus about a decade later, he is maybe a little bit younger, maybe a little bit older, 35. In their day, that is very young. Think about it. In their day, there may be people there who have been in this church longer than Timothy's been a Christian. They, have, they may have been saved before Timothy. They're definitely older than Timothy. He could be their son, some of them. He could be some of their grandchildren. And so they're despising him. Now, this is a perennial problem that every generation of the church faces at some point. At some point, a pastor will die. No amen, hallelujahs, thank you very much. At some point, no matter how long your pastor's been here now, he's 80, he's 85, he's filled with wisdom, he preaches with glory and all this stuff, eventually he will die. And unless you want to do another funeral in about 12 months, you end up getting a younger guy. Hopefully, there's been some wisdom in the planning and the legacy mindset, and there's younger guys trained up to take over so you don't do some big, horrible, uh, silly uh, church uh, pastor search and then bring in a guy that's totally different. Men should raise up men after them. But the point, every church has to do this at some point, and every generation uh, has to face it at, at, in some degree. The difficulty of the older congregation looking at and having to sit under the ministry of a younger, less experienced guy than what they might prefer. That happens. Now, at Hope, we're kind of in a, in a weird spot, right? We're not, we're not this 45 or 145-year-old church that has had multiple, you know, legacies of pastors beforehand. And, um, uh, you know, we're about 15 years old, and I came into the ministry about five years ago. Um, so, so we don't have this really long and, and, and uh, old, long-winded history. However, it is, it is a full history, but still remains the fact that if you're here, you have a relatively young pastor uh, in the uh, Australian average and statistics, right? especially for a church our size very young pastor. Um, church was planted by a 25-year-old uh, back in uh, 2009. So this is kind of where we're at. If you're, and maybe you feel that. If you are here and you are like 35 and you've had a job, the same job, for more than like five years, you're basically an ancient guru to all the teenage and, and, and young adults that are around. And they will, they, they, yeah, if you're older than that, they probably think you're dying soon. That's kind of how that we have so many young people. The average is like, 14, I don't know, something like that. Um, and so we were, when we were a lot smaller, and uh, I used to make sure I shook the hand of anybody with gray hair. I found that man, I shook his hand at the door, said, I am so glad you're here. Um, I would love some godliness that is older than my car around in this congregation. That would be great. Sometimes I met with a little bit of people despising youth, because it happens. Sometimes people despise youth because they, they, they are, um, uh, they are uh, uh, resentful. They're old, they've gone through sufferings, they know what life's really like, or at least older than you, so they just resent you. Oh, oh, this is cute. Yes, I like what you're trying to do around here. I was told in my early years of ministry, it might just be a smart idea to let the church close and find somewhere else to go to church for a while. Okay, great idea, Satan. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> One guy, I shook his hand, and he was an older fella, and I found out he used to be a pastor. I was, I'm so glad you've, you're visiting. Are you looking for a church? A guy, I am looking for a church. I'm like, well, it's, you know, <clears throat> do you want to grab a coffee this week with me? Uh, I really wanted to, you know, pull him into uh, our congregation and maybe uh, learn from some of his godliness and experience. And he says, oh, you know, it's, it's nice what you're doing here. You, you're okay for a young chap. 
All right, and you're mobile for an old man. Like, what are we doing here? We, was, oh, was that, I'm sorry, was that rude? Uh, uh, some, one guy told me uh, one time, he said, no, no, I, I wouldn't come to, I wouldn't be able to stick around at this church. My family's going to move elsewhere. Oh, it would be very hard to submit to a young man. Oh, well, it would be very hard to pastor such a proud man. Please don't stay, is what I told him. He's not here. Thank you. Uh, Timothy is being told, your youth is not a problem. Is it unusual that somebody under, th- under 40 in their culture is pastoring such a huge church? Is it unusual? Yeah. Is unusual unbiblical? Well, no, when the Bible has people raising from the dead and donkeys talking in the altar. No, unusual is not unbiblical. Uh, unforeseen or extraordinary, is that unbiblical? Not at all. Not at all. So Timothy, like many other generations of the church, is struggling with this sort of situation. He's a young guy, relatively, in a church with a rich heritage, and he has to pastor these people onto godliness. And this was a church that, to be honest, they didn't have a lot of faith. They didn't have a lot of faith. They'd stop growing. They weren't engaged in the Great Commission. Jesus rebukes them for that in Revelation. They had, uh, and, and if you don't have lots of faith and a young guy comes in, you go, oh, this can't work. How could this ever work? Jesus was not even, uh, surely he was 50 or 60 by the time he started his ministry. Anybody went, how, how old was Jesus? Oh, 30. Oh, also a youth. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus, the Messiah, was a youth in his day wrestling and wrangling and interlocking with old Pharisees, lecturers and, and theology professors. A young guy who, who was the mother of the Messiah, a teenage girl, had to raise the Messiah. It's pretty cool. Isaiah was a teenager very likely when he received the call from God to go into his preaching ministry. Probably started preaching in his early 20s, calling a nation to repentance. How good's that? God uses young people Evidently, welcome to hope. Uh, that some people have envy. Maybe they wanted to be the pastor and now this young buck is in. Maybe they have pride and arrogance and vitriol because they were the established false teaching pastor and his job first Sunday was to come in and fire them and their pastor wives and get them out of the pulpit and now they're angry at him sitting right there, front row, glaring, listening, judging. So Timothy has all these things going against him, and uh, he kind of reminds me of this guy. We studied him this week at the prayer meeting, W.G. Taylor, in Australia, in Brisbane. He was an English fella, came to Sydney. They sent him up to Brisbane, and he was 26 in the 1870s, 26 when he came to Brisbane, to an old historic church in Albert Street, Brisbane, that was a, had a big history, big heritage, big legacy, big reputation, and they did not want him. Nonetheless, he was sent by the denominational authorities. He rocked up. They despised having him there. He did what Paul said. He did not let them despise his youth, but preach the gospel. And revival struck in a matter of weeks. And then they loved him. (laughs) This happens. This is Timothy's situation. So here's our question. How, verse 12 says, let no one despise you for your youth. Question is, well, how? Verse 13 is the answer. The first part of the answer. Until I come, Paul says, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Timothy, you're standing up in the pulpit and you're hardly taller than it. Timothy, you have to climb the stairs to get up onto the stand in order to be able to preach the word. You you limp because the Bible they've given you is so big. You're so young. You squeaky voice. You have a crackly voice while you're preaching. You're still going through ancient uh, forms of puberty, right? He's he's like, "You're you're you're not demanding of respect. You don't look very intimidating and you don't carry authority. But the word of God does. And Timothy, you're not in ministry because of you. You're in ministry to spite you. You're not in ministry because you have something to say. You're in ministry because God uses men made of dust, clay jars, to put in what he has to say and break them open so that all people can see. We we have the treasure of God's word in jars of clay. He says, your words are not impressive. Your words are inexperienced. Your words are young, youthful, immature. But God's word stands forever as the greatest and the highest, the most fundamental authority in all of that world. Some young people want to come into ministry. I know I'll be hip. I'll have ideas. I'll be clever. I will be cool. And they fail and they earn God's judgment. And James 3 says they should never have been teachers 
If you're a young person striving towards the ministry, maybe a young man you need, uh, who sees uh, vocational ministry in the future, you need to be a man of the word. The word doesn't lack authority, even if your posture, your stature, your body weight does. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced this. The word of God carries authority, even if it's coming out of the mouth of an infant or a child or one of your teenage kids. Have you ever had this? Your kid, I have. Your kid says something, Dad. Doesn't the Bible say, didn't you teach us that? Aren't we supposed to, and I say something, and you want to, you know, I'm the dad, so shush, you don't, you're not allowed to, but it still cuts, it still binds, it still holds because it's the authority of God that they're quoting, uh, maybe that they learn from you. Uh, the, the word of God is still authoritative and can still punch and conform and transform us and nourish us. If it's coming out of the mouth of a child. Paul is telling Timothy, you need to commit to preaching the word because therein lies your authority and that will not allow them to despise your youth. But what will they point out? What will they say? That that you're too young to be quoting Isaiah? You're too young to be applying Jesus' words? No, you be a man of the word and there's nothing about you that they can shoot down. Disrespect the man, despise him. Don't uh, respect his, his, his gravitas if you want. Put the words coming out of his mouth are spirit inspired because they are biblical. We think of uh, Isaiah. We mentioned him before. Uh, Isaiah was a, a young, youthful preacher and prophet. And he speaks in chapter 8 about what God said to him. He says, For the Lord, the Lord thus spoke to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people. Right? The congregation I'm sending you to Isaiah is a nation. Don't do what they do. See where their worship has led? Attacks of other nations, God's judgment. You must be a firebrand from heaven that speaks God's word. Is what he says. God said to me, do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. The Lord of hosts, him you shall honour as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Are you afraid of the congregation, Timothy? How about you fear the living God? Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord and I will hope in him, Isaiah says. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and, and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. This is God's word for young men or any men who take the pulpit and start to speak anything other than God's inspired word. You have no light in you. You are leading people into hunger. You are leading God's people into darkness. And deep darkness, anguish, and judgment is waiting for you. Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. This language that he uses, just really quickly and historically, uh, he's really taken from Jewish tradition, which became early church tradition. That is that under the revival of Ezra, the priest and preacher, in Nehemiah chapter 8, go and read it, uh, he, uh, they make a little platform, they give a little stand for the, for the word, they put it on there, and basically they go, we, we, we didn't really know there was such a thing as a Bible, right? They, they had completely neglected, the, they didn't know that God wrote a book. So they find all of the old writings and they go, wow, we should, maybe we'll just read through this. And Ezra stands in front of them all in a huge congregation and just starts reading the Bible, just starts explaining its meaning and applying it to their lives. And I tell you, revival struck. It sounds like a scene out of the Great Awakening as people start crying and screaming over conviction of sin. And they have to command the people, stop yelling, stop crying. Today should be a day of joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But they were convulsed with conviction of sin because he was just reading the word, telling them what it meant, telling them to obey it. How complex is that? What evolved in the Jewish tradition is what was called synagogues, which means a little gathering. They would do that in all sorts of places. 
Whatever town you lived in, whatever city you were in, you would gather, you would come together. There would be a teacher who read some of the Old Testament law and then some of the prophets that explained it. And then they would teach on how to obey that. That's what they would do. They would do Bible reading, Bible explanation, and application. Does it sound familiar? That is what was happening in the day of Jesus. And in Jesus' ministry, that's what he utilized. He would go to synagogues, read their scriptures for them, and tell them what it meant and how it was fulfilled in him and his kingdom. And then after that, as the Jews were all saved, uh, many of them were saved in that early generation, the early church was by and large Jewish for about a decade. And at that point, they uh, were doing on a Sunday for Jesus exactly what they were doing on Saturday. They would go, they would read Moses, hear a prophet, and one of the elders in the local churches would say, this is how it points to Jesus. Don't you see Jesus in this text, in this prophecy? And therefore, here is how to live and here is what to obey. This is the most ancient form of church liturgy that exists, is reading the Bible out loud, understanding what it means, and being exhorted to faithful obedience. Do you understand that what you're doing here is as ancient a practice as it comes? You ever meet those silly, silly, idiotic, young, often men, something like women? I find it, it's often the guys who go, I'm after something ancient. Oh, I'm after something that really goes into the depths of history. And oh, oh, the Catholic Church, doesn't she have such ancient uh, uh, traditions? And oh, she's really the mother church. Because she is a whore that puts on pagan makeup and it distorts the word of God, first of all. Second of all, before she started dressing up in weird dresses with smells, bells, makeup and wine that they call blood. Before they did that nonsense, do you know what the church was already doing for hundreds of years? Reading the Bible publicly in the language that people understood, not high Latin. Explaining what it meant, not hiding what it meant under allegory. Requiring obedience, not telling people to do stupid penance. You want something traditional? You want to be a part of something rich and ancient? Do this as often as you can. But of course, the authority to do that is not on its antiquity or its history, the authority to do that is because it is the word of God. Not tradition, but scripture. He then says, do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by the Holy, uh, sorry, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands upon you. He's saying, look, don't let them despise you for your youth. Just speak the word of God. They'll have nothing to argue with. But also, Timothy, let me have a personal word with you, son. He's very fatherly. He's very pastoral. He's very caring. Because sometimes men can be devoted to preaching Scripture because that that was drilled into them by their pastor who trained them. They just know, preach Scripture. But internally, they are so unsure of if they're truly called of God to be in the ministry. As I say, men men question this, and their whole ministry is, is turned down a notch deteriorates, that they don't have that clarity of conscience and a sense of conviction because, because the devil's getting to them. People despising them is getting to them. They care too much about what people think. It's getting to them, and they slump. What Tim- Timothy is hearing right now is Paul saying, what you preach is the word of God till you die, right? Till you die, do that. But Timothy, also, don't you remember that God confirmed to you that you were called to this? Step one, the elders laid their hands upon you and agreed. That's what they're laying hands on. We were in unity. We agreed. We looked upon you with favor and we saw what God had done in your gifts and in your life and in your fruit. And we agreed this man should go with Paul in the Great Commission. So don't you remember when the council of elders in Lystra, we got you together, we prayed for you, we put our hands upon you and we commissioned you to the ministry. I mean, if you doubt yourself, Timothy, at least don't doubt me. I was sure of that calling. And you know what, if if that's not enough, didn't God himself give witness in that moment that you were called to preach the word in season and out of season? Don't you remember? It was was Jack, who knows? Elder Jack, he, he had the prophecy. Timothy, do you remember when he laid his hands upon you, spoke the word of God by prophecy, and you received the imparting gift of teaching, of of preaching for the Great Commission purposes in the local church? Don't you remember, Timothy? This is what he's doing. He's calling him to remembrance of that calling, of that assurance that he should, he should remember to, to flame the gift that he has, to fan it into a blazing fire. Because here's the risk. Timothy is not just risking his own happiness in ministry. 
He's not just risking that, oh, I'm, maybe I won't be one of those fruitful pastors, but, you know, I'll give him a crack and I'll do him a good job and I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll do what I can until I die. I'll have a little church, a little organ, a little, little building, and it'll be fine. He's not just risking the sacrifice of his own potential, whatever that means. He was risking the squandering of a talent given by the Lord of Lords. A talent and a gift, which Jesus tells us in his parables, on judgment day will be required of the man of God and required of every Christian with the question, what investment have you made upon it? You know what Jesus does and ask? How did you feel about my gifting? Was that a bit hard for you? Is that tough? 2020 in Australia, is that a real hard generation to live in? doesn't come back and ask the man who buried the talent. He goes, no, well, well, tell me about your mindset here and your emotional process and why you came to this decision about burying the gift I gave. He says, where's the profit? Where is the investment? I did not save you from hell. I did not impart to you my Holy Spirit. I did not assign to you a specifically chosen gift of the Holy Spirit. I did not place you in the local church with so much opportunity. Timothy, I did not give you a mentor in the Apostle Paul. I did not give you the honor of being mentioned, exemplified, told about in Holy Scripture. I did not send you to Ephesus with the, decl- with the declaration of the gospel in hand for you to neglect the ministry, and the gift, and say, it's too hard, Jesus. It's Timothy. You received the call. You stepped into the commission. Now do not neglect that gift. Do not, do not blame the people either. Oh, they were rushing at me with their, with their buckets of water, and they put out my fire. God, no. That gift was given by the Holy Spirit. You alone can extinguish it. In 2 Timothy, he's told, fan it into flame. Whatever they do, you preach the word, Timothy. Whatever they say, you don't neglect your gift. Whatever they do, don't be a coward. Don't fear man. Don't live in timidity and make excuses about it because of your extenuating circumstances and situation. Stand up, O man of God. Preach the word. Don't let them despise you for your youth. This is the command to Timothy. He then says, part two, set them an example. How do you keep them from despising you for your youth? Well, don't fail to speak God's word, but also don't fail to live out God's word. Utilize your preaching gift and the preaching of the word. There's your authority. But uh, Verse um, 15 says, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress so that all may see your progress. Timothy's example now, we've looked at what he should do. Don't neglect the gift, preach the word. Now what he should be, his example in front of everybody needs to back that ministry of the word up. He needs to embody in front of them what he's explaining to them. Richard Baxter in the 1600s uh, spoke to pastors and he said, do not say in your sermon what you will then go un and unsay in your week. Don't unsay Monday to Saturday what you have spent all day saying on Sunday. Don't live one way that, that contradicts the preaching of the gospel. Set them an example. A young man, if he, if he cannot arrive into a pulpit and simply demand authority by his presence and his age and his cultural respect, he must demand respect and honor by his godly example. So that if they want to ignore him, he's not a presence, he's not a threat, he's not, a, you know, he's, he's not even a real man yet, he's still a youth. Yes, but we cannot ignore his example. His godliness, his speech, his conduct, his faith, his love, his purity, it's beaming out of him. He may have fewer years, but there is much godliness in those years. There is much maturity in the young man. He should set such an example that his age is forgotten. Paul doesn't tell him to go get beard implants to look a little bit older. Get some talcum powder to make his hair look a little bit grayer. Doesn't say that. He says, set them an example so that they see you. And though they mock your youth, they're really mocking themselves because a youth is overtaking them. So he says to them, therefore, practice and immerse yourself in these things. 
What is these things? These things is um, exemplifying. These things is fanning into flame his gift. These things is preaching the word. These things is also what we saw in previous paragraphs, like up in verse uh, uh, 6 through 10, where he told him, train yourself for godliness. Nourish yourself on the words of the faith and the good doctrine. Do these, practice these things. He doesn't say, get to them when you get to them. If you come across these things like Bible reading in your ministry, you know, do them. He says practice. That means carve out time in your week. Discipline. Make a schedule. Set time apart. Practice these things as an intentional decision. Also, immerse yourself in these things. Some of us are not practicing these things where we're not opposed to these things. Bible, godliness, you know, Great Commission fruit, praying. Stuff. I don't hate them. I'll do them. If the devil allows them to come across my path, I'll, I'll give it a crack. No. You take responsibility over this, this unredeemable, passing away at every moment asset that God gives you called time. One hour at a time. It is all passing away, never to be repeated, no callbacks. You have a limited amount of time in this world. I'm asking you, have you budgeted that properly in the form of a schedule? Form of a schedule. Do you have a plan out what you do Monday, what you do Tuesday, what you do? Do you have plan? Where's your study? Where's your exercise? Where's your this? Where's your meetings? Where's your time? Where's your chores? Where's your family time? Where's your Bible study? Where's your church? Do you do that? I hope that you do so that you can intentionally slot and carve out time for these good practices. But I love also that he doesn't just say practice them, make a discipline. He also says immerse yourselves in them. So it's not enough to take up some, some grand goblet of, of water from the living water of God and, and douse your life and sprinkle it all over in godly habits. That's practicing them. He says, immerse yourself. He says, plunge the entire thing down in the water and only practice what comes up holy and washed in God's word. I wonder whether that can describe your life. As you look at your schedule, can it be said of you that you immerse your life in godly activities, in great commission activities, in redeemable, sanctified, godly, eternal-minded activities. Well, Paul tells Timothy to do just that, and in so doing, be an example to every Christian. Set the example, which means this is not just all applying to pastors. This is applying to every Christian, because he's meant to be an example to everybody else. Do you practice? Do you immerse yourself? And are you seeing progress? He's not telling Timothy to boast and show off. He's saying, let them just see it. It will be unavoidable. Don't try and explain to them how much you read and what you do and how long you pray and how up early you are and how late up you are. And all that. Don't tell them. Just let them see it. They'll see the fruit. They will absolutely see it. And as they see your progress, they will be reprimanded. They will be, they'll be rebuked. They will be challenged. They'll be inspired. They'll be exhilarated. They'll be called to action. They read Hebrews 11, a grand a hall of fame of faith of dead saints. And then they'll see you. They'll say, oh, there he is. Look at his example. Look at how he is like David. He is like this man. He is like these people of the scripture. Look at the example that I could be following and should be following. So he's told, progress, progress, progress. One of the, one of the, 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 the deadly and fatal things for men's ministry is not necessarily evil or ungodliness, but stagnation. So maybe they're really, and this is especially for you young men who are naturally gifted. There's a problem. You can, naturally, you're sort of 10 10 yards ahead of everybody else off the starting line. Well, this is pretty good. I'm naturally gifted. I'm better than them. I'm smarter than them. Scripture seems to naturally make more sense to me. I'm more of a leader. I'm more charismatic. I can do public speaking. I'm, I'm pretty good with people. I'm good. I'm better. And that's enough. What happens is that those who are like Timothy, who are naturally ungifted but spiritually called, start practicing, start immersing, start progressing, and they overtake the naturally gifted but lazy. Spurgeon spoke to his pastor's college, those he was training for the ministry, and he was talking about the, 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 the tendency of pastors to not progress because they get buried in the administration and in the bureaucracy of running a church. He says, brethren, do something. Timothy, set them an example in progression. Oh, there's so much to manage. Timothy, do something. Do something. Do something. While committees waste their time over resolutions, 
do something. While societies and unions and denominations are making constitutions, let us win souls. Too often we discuss and discuss and discuss and Satan laughs in his sleeve. It's time we had done planning and sought something worth planning. I pray you, be men action, all of you. Get to work and quit yourselves like men. And then he quotes this old Russian general who had been in his work for 50 years, over 60 major battles and never saw a loss. Here is his highly theorized, super technical ministry and philosophy of warfare. You ready? Spurgeon says, I like old Suvorov's idea of war. Forward and strike, no theory. Attack, form column, charge bayonets, plunge into the center of the enemy. Get to work. Series just turned on and has ruined my quotation. Get out of here, woman. <laughs> we'll have to start again. Attack, form column, charge bayonets, plunge into the center of the enemy. That was his plan. Our aim is to save sinners, Spurgeon says. And this we are not to talk about, but to do in the power of God. Timothy needed to hear, stop getting worked up, stop getting bogged down in the ministerial bureaucracy administration. The devil's laughing while you're planning. Get up, preach, don't neglect your gift. Set an example and progress and progress and be better. Spurgeon spoke in this funny lecture about ministerial progression. Pastors always be seeking more holiness, more productivity, more skill in the word, more more, um, ability in communicating God's word. And he suggested that there might be some of you who think, oh, I'm just a humble communicator and my words blur and I'm not that great in the word of God, but the Holy Spirit can use me anyway. And he exposed that laziness, but he has this to say. He says, and, oh, other people who, who, out of their laziness, say, oh, if I learn a lot, I'll get proud. <laughs> Loser. Spurgeon says, when grace abounds, learning will not puff you up. Or injure your simplicity in the gospel. No, serve God with as much of an education as you have or don't have, and thank him for blowing through you even if you're merely a ram's horn. Like just a dead animal, sawed off horn, drilled hole, and somebody's blowing through that and, and a blast is going. Good on you if that's you. But if there is a possibility of becoming a silver trumpet, choose it. You know, some of us have natural enough gift. And, you know, God spoke through a donk in the Old Testament. That's enough, you know. Some pastors are like donkeys. And that's just me. I'll do. Now, we must always, gentlemen, call to the ministry in the future, currently laboring as an elder here or elsewhere, Your call is to progress, to show the saints of God what might be possible if they just took up this word and believed it. Our example should be one of constant progression. Here in verse 16, he then says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. So so we learned, how should you not let people despise you for your youth? Teach the word of God. Do not neglect your gift. All right. How should I set an example to the people? First, by progressing and showing them what's possible. And secondly, by keeping a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. A minister, is in his whole life is a sermon. You never clock off and go home. Everything you do, everything, you're always a minister of God. You're always a pastor wherever you go. And it's true for Christians. You never clock off being a Christian. You're always representing Jesus either well or poorly. You need to watch everything, Timothy. Your whole life, keep a close, scrutinous eye upon it and sanctify everything. Because your life is kind of the page upon which your sermons are written. There's a stained page. No matter how good the words, it'll be filthy in people's eyes. Just the other day, I was ironing a shirt, one of my favorite shirts, a good, a button-up shirt. So I was, you know, doing it. I was about to have a speaking engagement. And I was borrowing somebody's iron, and I put it across, you know, that was great shirt, love the shirt, and smeared some kind of red stain all over it. I don't know what it was. Maybe a kid had put a crown on the iron. I'm not sure. It was this glittery red stuff all over the iron. And I stained my shirt. 
and in desperation, not knowing what to do for my speaking engagement, coming up very shortly, I had to wash and I washed the iron and I thought, can I make it work? Can I iron around it? And sort of ironed and thought, okay, well, it looks pristine now from the front. And the back, though stained, is nicely ironed. I tell you, the seams, were, I'm getting pretty good. The seams were, they were crisp. They're almost starchy. The collar, um, unblemished. The, the sleeves, just for how I roll them up, it was, a, it was a good iron, all right? But on the back, a terrible stain. Now, how many of you would think that's an appropriate, an appropriate shirt to wear preaching, to wear in the house of God, or to wear to some, maybe a fine date or some other kind of engagement, though well ironed, smeared? This is the life of some pastors. Their theology is tight. Their preaching, their communication, their skills are impressive, almost otherworldly. Their life, as they turn around to go and live their Monday through Saturday, is stained with ungodliness, with, with coarse joking, with evil speech, with unrighteous relationships, with, 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 with addictions of different kinds. And Paul is telling Timothy, clean shirt, well ironed shirt. Your life and your doctrine. And then he summarizes, he, he, he concludes. So big ideas have been this. A young guy had to maintain God's order in his household, though the opposition, don't let them despise you. So preach and do not neglect the gift. Set them an example in progression and keep a close watch on your life and doctrine. And here's the reason these things are so important. Here's the reason All of a minister's life and doctrine and teaching and ministry is so important. Look at the end of verse 16. Persist in this. Don't give up. Persevere. Week by week, day by day, Jesus will take you home at some point or come back and what a day it'll be, but persist in this till then. Because by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You will save, Timothy, yourself and those who hear you. Now, I think if I can be helpful, a good word to use in place of save, unless we're getting confusing, oh, Timothy has the power to grant eternal salvation. Well, in some sense, as a gospel preacher, you're called to that. But in a more helpful sense, we could say, in doing so, you will spare both yourself and your hearers. You will spare yourself and you will spare your hearers from what, you ask? From the last day of judgment, being a day of regret, being a day of rebuke, being a day of severity, and being a day of loss instead of a day of great joy. And I'm talking about Christians. First Corinthians 3 tells this analogy where Paul says, people are spending their whole lives in ministry and as Christians. We're spending our whole lives building a home. We're building a building. They're constructing it with beams and with a roof and with flooring and with walls and with certain windows and certain decorations and accessories. We're all doing that whether you realize it or not. And the foundation that we're building upon is Jesus' finished work which grants us heaven forever. Amen. But you are called to build upon that foundation. Paul says, the day of judgment is like a day of fire. Everything you've built is put in a furnace. And only what comes out is what you're rewarded for. If your whole life is amazing big building, you don't get rewarded for that. You get rewarded for what stands the test of God's scrutiny and judgment. Did you build with the right things? Paul's analogy is this. If you built with rock, with straw and hay and stubble, recycled wood from the side of the street, idiotic human ideas called straw and uh, and hay and stubble. And you just sort of sticky taped it all together and stapled a few things in place. And you had this huge thing called a great reputation and an amazing ministry and a huge church. And you get to judgment day. And that has been built without the preaching of the word, the prayers of the saints, without uh, uh, keeping your gift alive. And if you feared man rather than God, that day will be a day of regret as your entire life, which you don't get to redo, is put into the furnace, burned to a crisp, and you get to go into heaven, yes, but with a wasted life behind you. Wasted. You could have built upon Christ. And the point is that when you're in heaven with more rewards, you can give more glory to Jesus Christ. But you have neglected, you have lost, you have have lost that opportunity because you spent this life wasting it 
That is true for Christians, that is true for ministers. And Paul is saying this, Timothy, give yourself and give your hearers the best opportunity at the best judgment day possible. That's my my mindset in ministry. I've said it often. Say it again. I'll say it again and again and again until I'm dead. My job as a pastor is to try with all that I can manage to give you the best judgment day possible. I don't care about your Monday. I don't care if you like me. I don't care if all of your dreams wither and die in all of this life and you call yourself depressed and you have burnout. I don't care. If it is because you are building with, with gold, with silver, with precious stones. So on that day of judgment, and I'm standing there next year, and you're annoyed at me because I told you to be obedient your whole life. But then Jesus lowers down this smorgasbord of rewards for you. And you get to enjoy glory more. You get to glorify Jesus more because you heard the word that was preached. That's my goal. If I neglect it, I do not spare you. I do not love you. If I neglect that, I do not even love myself. And I do not spare myself. And that day of judgment will be one of rebuke from the Lord. Harsh, harsh judgment from my mistreatment of his word. Misuse of his gospel. Mis- mismanagement of his own bride, the church. I lose out on rewards. And then I stand next to my wife who stands judgment. And I lose more rewards because she didn't have as many. And then one by one, everybody who is ever a member at my church stands here and has rewards diminished, has life rebuked, has opportunities wasted because I did not speak to them the word. This is why I get excited. This is why I get a bit intense. This is why true ministry will demand so much of all of us because friends, we have not this day, not tomorrow, not any other day in mind, but that day, that day, that day shapes all of our ministry here. And that means that if you are here and you are not yet a Christian, I want you to think about that day. I want you to not just get rewards on that day. I want you to be there with us on that day. I want you to be in heaven with us on that day. I want to see you in heaven and not not flying down to the chasm and the torment of hell. Will you be with us on that day? Will you go into heaven and glory and, and bliss and enjoyment and rewards on that day? That's the day Jesus has in mind right now. And that's why he speaks so harshly to you when he says you're a sinner. You're a rebel. You're self-righteous, you're pervert, you're you're a liar, you're ungodly, you're an idolater, you're a fornicator. Whatever Jesus says to you with harshness now, he says because he sees that day in his mind. And Jesus would compel you, meet him now as merciful saviour. Meet him now as one still holding out entrance into heaven right now. Meet him now like that instead of meeting him on that day as judge, as Severe king and his punisher. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. He lived in your place. He rose again from the dead. He reigns in heaven. Come to Jesus today and be saved. Let's pray. Father God, it is impossible even to put into words the severity, the gravity, the importance of being a herald of your word of being a member of the church who hears the heralding of the word. These are not playthings. These are not human inventions. This is not merely tradition. This is spiritual, eternal reality. I praise you, Lord God, that here, personally, Lord, I have the freedom, the joy of preaching the word and people being encouraged, loving it, uh, applying it. Your spirit is active and at work here, Lord God, and for that we say thank you. Lord God, we also ask that he would, he would increase our progress, that he would increase in each one of us godliness and output for the Great Commission so that we can glorify you more, so that that day of judgment would be one of joy, would be one of reward and not one of shame and regret. Father God, please lead us by your Spirit to, like Jesus, leverage every opportunity for growing your kingdom. Father God, I pray that for those who are in our midst...